Standing on your hands. Standing on my hands. <laughs> I won't <laughs> last very long. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think, see if it's fine. Okay. Yeah, let's do that then. Do you want to? Yeah. Sure. Since the goal is more conversational than present. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, for inviting us here. Uh, it's a pleasure. So, um, yes, Hans and I were working in the essentially in the R and D part of of Cognex for deep learning. And uh, I'm overseeing a team of uh, engineers in Natick in Switzerland and also in Korea, South Korea. And Hans specifically, he's leading the uh, embedded part of, uh, of the research team. And you know, that's why I brought this here. And so uh, what, uh, what we're interested in is, uh, is, is deep learning, obviously. But uh, more importantly, lately, we've started a new project and interview which we call edge learning. And essentially, what we're trying to do is to make it ever more easy to use uh, deep learning technologies in manufacturing and inspection tasks. And so um, maybe let me oh, wrong button here, I guess. Oh, there we go. So uh, let me let me take, take a step back maybe first uh, about uh, Cognex. Who, who in here has ever heard about Cognex or Okay, so Cognex has been around for a while, like right? uh, uh, we had actually a 40th anniversary last year. And Cognex really started off with um, machine vision, rule-based machine vision, I would say, right? And back, back in the 80s, the first system, believe it or not, actually an OCR system, uh, optical character recognition, something that we will talk about today in a bit more detail. And uh, still, it's, uh, it's a topic. Uh, but, but what is it? Rule-based vision is really is this localization to detect objects very precisely, very quickly. Uh, for you know, robot guidance, for instance, it's gauging, measure a you know a pinhole, the yeah, diameter very precisely, so you can make sure that's pressed to fit and it actually works. Uh, code reading, ID, barcodes, QR codes, uh, you name it. But uh, let's say for the better part of those 40 years, let's say for 35 years, it was really that's what Cognix was focusing on. And there were certain things that Cognix did not touch. And that's basically all the things that humans are good at. Humans are good at aesthetic inspection, like, you know, looking at surfaces, finding, finding out what is exactly a problem and whatnot, anomaly detection finding issues which you're not told exactly what you're looking for, but just by, you know, let's say one class classifiers or whatever, you figure out what is the difference that uh, may be relevant or not. Or then general purpose classification, you look at two <coughs> different categories of objects, you have lots of in-class variation, and, you know, humans are very good in sort of, let's say, distinguishing apples from oranges, no matter in what context, no matter what illumination and so on. That's all things that actually rule-based systems are really struggling at. And so, uh, you know, all of this, uh, this capabilities were, of course, highly interesting, but nobody really had a handle on it. Back in the 80s also, by the way, around the same at, uh, time, artificial neural networks was a hot topic. There was one of well, maybe the first or even the second of the hypes that uh, ANNs went through, right? Uh, but it was a little bit disappointing because it didn't really go all that far. Uh, but I think things really started to change as probably all of you know, around the 2000s, I would say, in my mind, I think three things really changed, right? First things that changed was that there was quite a bit of advance in the theory about why do these networks not converge as well as they should, right? What happens if I go very deep in a network that suddenly nothing works anymore? Uh, so it was really the theory that moved forward. The other thing, however, is also compute with GPUs and uh, GPU general purpose compute suddenly people were able to sort of like, you know, orders of magnitude do more computation and actually really also think or build models that have a certain complexity, which is sort of needed to solve real world problems. And the third thing uh, is really data is the, with the internet, with the images that you can sort of download all over the place and then collect. Suddenly people started to collect these gigantic data sets where they could really start training uh, larger models and ImageNet is probably the, the best known example, I think. ImageNet was probably the one thing that moved this whole technology forward uh, the most uh, in these early, let's say, deep learning phases, right? And back at that time, here's an example of, uh, you know, an image that was published, I think, around 2010. 
to have a network, a model that is able to look at a scene like this, to do detection and to classify those objects a couple of years before that image, it was simply, you know, people could not think that this is actually possible. When this happened, however, you know, uh, there's uh, companies like Cognex, but generally people who do machine vision in factory automation, of course, they were very, very interested in that because they now could sort of maybe really start to tackle problems that humans were much better at, right? And there's, there's many reasons why you would love what, as you're all sort of interested in here, uh, why you want to do that. However, um, the problem that obviously is with these kind of networks is that, you know, at that time still, you need millions of images. You had, you know, days or weeks of training. You needed lots of computers and you have to have an expert who sort of handhelds and holds the process through training uh, and actually get the actual performance that you want. And so when you look at industrial factory automation, the challenge there are a little bit different, right? In a way, we do not necessarily in many applications have those millions of images. We have each customer, each problem that they're looking at is a very specific sort of dedicated inspection problem. They're looking at weird looking components that uh, have, you know, sort of small, tiny little differences from one part to the next. And that's what they want to detect. It has nothing to do with natural images, natural image statistics, but they, all of that with most networks these days with ImageNet and what our uh, uh, data sets are trained on. They're very dissimilar. However, what is, uh, also different or is true is that in most of those applications you have those components which have much less intra-class variation right so the problem you're looking at is much more constrained so in both ways it's an opportunity but it's also um, a challenge the next thing is that uh, in our specific uh, situation we have let's say 10,000 customers each of those want to solve five problems per year that makes like 50,000 problems that need to be solved right so what we're trying to do really is we want to have a product that can be empowering the, the customer to do these kind of solutions himself, right? We cannot have a service model where basically customers say, look, that's my problem. Please help us solve this. It just wouldn't scale. So we have to come up with a solution of how can we make this process of training and validating and deploying such a system much easier because we can't really rely on every customer having a deep learning expert, but we have to you know, work with people like operators or quality assurance people that, sure, they can be trained on the task, but they're not necessarily the data scientists out there that can you know, sort of properly select you know, which kind of data sets, how do I mix them up, how do I cross-validate, how do I, all these kind of things. So you want to have a tool or a, a, a product really that helps you with this. And the third thing really is uh, the compute side. Um, let's say for deploying, lots of customers, they sort of, they hesitate really to go, let's say, to the cloud to uh, to do like inference. I'm not talking about training now, but really about once you have a model, how do you deploy that? They want to be able to run that locally on a machine or even on just a smart camera, like the one that we brought along here, because it makes it for them much more easy to deploy, right? To sort of, believe it or not, today in, uh, in, a, in a factory, to buy a computer with a, a big, you know, GTX type of, of GPU with two vans and then, then a 500 watt power supply that is actually quite challenging. They really want to have fanless and ideally even they want to you know, go embed it. So we have to have a, a way to sort of deploy these systems really on a, on a, on a small camera. And um, so what we have uh, done is with, you know, uh, for about two years now, we have this product out there, which is really the way that customers use this, they take that camera, they point it on a, on a production line, they collect images, they uh, label those, train a model, and then uh, redeploy that. But what is interesting or important here is that this part here, the collection, the process of going through the data set and labeling, which the customer needs to do, and also to train that model and deploy that, that's all happening still on a PC, you need a GPU. So you're sort of only halfway there is. You still need something that, you know, you can sort of run, a, a, in this case, it's a fat client, in order to sort of tune your model and deploy it onto the camera. More importantly, however, what we've seen is that there's this strict separation between deployment and development. On one hand, development is really, they collect images, they label, they train a model, 
they optimized, they may change their strategy of how to label or how to train, and they iterate over and over again until they got something that they can live with, deploy that. But then what happens typically is after you know, a week, after a month, after three months, something changes. The product changes maybe intentionally, non-intentionally. It's just a, the material that is being used changes. Uh, the customer was always having like blue stickers on it and suddenly, you know, there's yellow stickers and for the customer, it's the same thing, right? For a camera, obviously not. Uh, or then there's also things like an environment that can change. You have to replace to have the light source and whatnot. And so the, um, they have to constantly go back and forth. And from the feedback that we got, that people are really struggling with this because these are these two different worlds. They basically have to keep that development environment sort of around. They have to maybe not use it for three months and then so they have to go back and change something so they have to manage that. All of this is complicated. Can, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think you described scenarios where it becomes obvious to them that the model has to change. But how many times this becomes obvious after the, some customers are calling and say, hey, what the heck is going on with your quality? Uh, uh, you know, you have too many error, too many faulty parts sneaking through your system. Uh, and they just retrospectively find about that. And so speaking to that, so to what extent they can benefit or, or it's easy to find mechanism to actually alert them proactively that something that they need to go back to the development. Mm -hmm. That's actually a, a very interesting discussion. We just had that uh, lately uh, um, within the R&D team. We're uh, looking into some technologies to sort of do uh, continuous monitoring and sort of you know analyze how does, let's say, the network respond to changes in the environment. Uh, we're right now, we're sort of testing with, let's say, more the sales or marketing side, like what is the need for that really? And from what we're hearing is actually that they say, the, let's say there's not that many customers that really ask for that kind of functionality. I'm a little surprised myself, honestly. But the argument is that they have already lots of other mechanisms in place to detect exactly what you're saying, right? I mean, let's say they have to have a number. 3% is going to be bad, right? If suddenly it jumps up to 6%, whether or not they know what happens, they just know something has happened. They may, that may not even go back to the customer before that. That's happens. the good scenario. Because, because, good because they get the what happened. Right? Yeah. But, uh, but it's, 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 it's a good point. I think it would be very helpful to have that kind of early detection and monitoring. Right now, it's almost like, a, like fighting internally whether other people think it's also important. <laughs> So um, it's interesting. Yeah. It's actually, I'm, I'm surprised as well by the fact that <clears throat> you didn't hear it too often, but you know, I suspect potentially, you, you know, not all the time the customer will report on that. Right? Like something yeah. you don't want to say, uh, talk about like, uh, oh, my customers just called me and they shouted at me because my quality. How did, did we signal that in the work that Chris was doing when, you know, there was kind of changes Due to concept drift. Well, uh, we were looking at time series models rather than images, but yeah. um, basically it became very obvious that, that the, the, the concept drift was, was happening because you started getting so many false alarms. That's so right. For an anomaly detection, it becomes problematic right away as opposed to missing alarms, a lot of false alarms. <laughs> you, you don't want every, every third, uh, you know. Uh, it's, it's actually I think that that number right that they know that's sort of it depends of course if you have very seldom events right. then it's, it's more difficult but if they sort of have a constant let's say two percent you know right. uh throw out they're actually they have mechanisms in place to to do that as a matter of fact somebody told me in the past that when they do manual inspection that's actually even a problem because they expect two percent and they have proven that if now suddenly for whatever reason the quality goes up or goes down, people just keep on throwing out 2%. Right? <laughs> so that's sort of the advantage you have with an automated system. It will, it will just, you know, be at sort of a certain threshold, but um, that, that would be a way to detect it. So, um, I'm not scared. So, um, and, and given all that, basically, we really sort of went back to the drawing board and said, well, couldn't we do something a little bit better, right? We're willing to pay a price for that, which is, you know, we may not be so to be able to solve the most complex problems out there, 
But if we can sort of get a little closer to what we humans are able to do, that'd be really nice, right? Because the big difference between, I guess, still deep learning today and humans is that, let's say in deep learning, you need hundreds or maybe thousands images per class. If you tackle very complex problems, you need maybe more than that. Uh, and, you know, or let me start this way. I think deep learning, there's a couple of applications out there that deep learning today is really better than humans, right? It beats humans. Right, straight out, it's an image net. I think there's one of them, there's others uh, where it is better. The difference here, however, is in deep learning still you need a, a good amount of images. Whereas, you know, you can give a human an image, one class, one sample. It can even be something that is not even a real image, but like, more like a, a concept. And that, from that one sample, this, the human can train or can basically learn and then reproduce that thereafter, right? And so that's basically what these systems now get start to get compared to at a customer and he's like well you know, my inspector can do that why can't that system not do it why do i still have to tell it you know 100 times that this is a or this is b and so um <coughs> that's why it's a stroll wheel that does it <laughs> and so then uh, you know we set out uh, really this this project where they say you know we turned that edge learning where basically we want to sort of, you know, if you remember, you have these two parts of deployment and development. We want to split that apart and say, let's move everything to the camera. Basically, if we can get everything, the training on happening on one device like that, we can basically make that whole process a lot easier. But for that, I think there's one thing we need much fewer images to train, and we need to be able to do it on such a device. This is about the equivalent of a Raspberry Pi in terms of compute, right? Uh, both for inference, obviously, but also for training. And then if we can do these two things, I believe that the ease of use drastically increases, right? Because now suddenly you don't have to go back and forth. You don't have different systems. You can really sort of think of this almost like as a sensor. And this is not a camera. It's not a smart camera that you go and program, but it's a sensor. You point at something and you configure it really, right? You teach it by, you know, showing five and uh, samples of this, five samples of that, and then off it goes. And then, of course, you know the question, how do you do that? I mean, there's a lot of interesting techniques these days uh, in, uh, in deep learning, which is you know, unsupervised pre-training, you can do transfer learning, you can do metric learning, all kinds of things in order to find a way of how can you train with very few images and how can you also only learn on certain aspects of the network and not of the whole thing in order to merely adapt the system to the new situation much rather than you know do a full full blown retraining, which obviously not such a dice. But you you're assuming that we have some basic some basic network that is already trained exactly. and working pretty well, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's 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 basically you have something that you pre-train, right? Either specifically for a domain, that's what the Hans will show later, or something more generically. And depending on which situation you're in, you will do better or worse, right? And you will not get to the full um, let's say performance of, a, of an end-to-end -end train system, but it will allow you to, to tackle certain problems more easily than if you go all the way back to say, oh, well, let's, let's solve this route. <coughs> right. it, 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 I mean, I'm assuming that it shortened your time to market of new, you know, like if you, if you let's say there are some changes, mm -hmm. this allows you to maybe uh, be operationally like in, within a several days rather than mm -hmm. like now collect data for weeks. Exactly. Is that, is that kind of that's the idea, right? So basically that by fewer images, you, you need to wait a, a lot shorter time to actually collect those images. You also need less time to actually label them, right? And then by doing it as directly on the camera <laughs> will allow you to basically not to have to, to you know, to have different system. The whole system complexity is to be spread reduced because basically now everything is contained in that one uh, little brick there, right? And all overall, that should really help you to go faster into a deployment. And then also, once something changes, it should be much easier to change and adapt to the new changes, right? If there's suddenly a new product coming along, you just teach it on the device, you give it five images, it trains, and now it's back, uh, back up and running. And I think the other thing that matches the workflow of how you train all your other systems today that aren't deep learning. Exactly. You just give someone a gold standard and it tells them it's not right. like this. Yeah. So. Because all the rule-based tools, right. they, they don't really have that notion of collecting huge data sets, labeling huge data sets, training them for hours or days on a GPU with like, you know, all the complexity that comes with it. They, most of those systems, like, you know, they're, they're trained on one sample <laughs> where you sort of say, oh, that's the line I'm looking for. You tweak your command parameters until that line shows up properly. 
and then that's that's basically the end of it. Right. Uh, so, sorry, can I have one final question on, on that part? Uh, so, for, for you guys to be able to run the networks directly on that trip, uh, like sharing the sensor, do you guys have uh, like proprietary architectures on the silicon, or uh, on on that here? That's actually, as I said, it's pretty much like um, a what is a quad core A53. So that's, that's not really special. We have cameras that do have accelerators on it, um, but that's basically, and these days they really come with, with chips, right? So, so we, uh, 20 years ago, <laughs> Cognex did like their own chips, but we really got away from that, honestly, because- for the architecture part, I would say that the proprietary part of this is how we train this, mm. more the secret sauce is more how we train it rather than the architecture itself. Okay. And, like final question on the software side, um, you guys use like a full version of PyTorch, or do you guys use the? I know that there's a slight version that's meant for like hardware, right? That just mm -hmm. makes it better. So we found out because we need to train it, we are using the full version. Okay, I love it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Which we're hoping not to. Sure, so <laughs> it is a bit less. Are there? Uh, you're talking about like having doing it all on that device there, but are there? multiple de devices usually on the same line and then do you have to instruct them either to communicate with each other or you know it's kind of tailored to that particular manufacturing system maybe that's that's an interesting question the the thing is that um you have both right you have what you often have is actually have multiple lights yeah right and now sort of uh, just right. to put a, for to, to go parallel basically you will basically need that same system on those different lines now, uh, there is a way on, on such a product to extract a model, move it over and you know, distribute it to other cameras. And actually we're sort of working on a system that could sort of also help them automate that, uh, but more like an, an overarching sort of, it's called edge intelligence system really, sort of to, to, to take a model and distribute it across cameras. Mm -hmm. But uh, th that complexity actually, you know, also means that if you now have a systematic change between production lines, you would actually really want to collect images from these different production lines in order to train your model right. and then redeploy again out, right? And that again, it's not impossible, but it just adds <clears throat> complexity. So with a system like this, if the task is not too complicated, if you think about it, you just have to collect five of each, it's probably in the end easier to just do it, you know, set it up for each line individually. And then at least for each line, you have dedicated, you know, performance because it was really trained on that line. So it depends a bit on which use case. I think the advantage of such a system, you could also really just train each line by itself because it literally just takes a couple of minutes to, minutes to train it, right? Do you then evaluate like the compare the performance between multiple? I mean, I think that'd be really interesting, right? Like if one, both if, if, if one line is performing better than the others, it would be maybe insightful on oh, what, yeah. what's different, but it also, I imagine that the customers wouldn't want the variation if it's if it's the same product or like how do you re do you revisit that or the, the thing is that the customers i mean we're, we're not doing that anyway right but it's all the customers that uh, that do this so uh, I, I know because there are customers that do a huge amount of effort to get those let's say 10 production lines which are identical on paper at least right. to get them as close to identical as possible right they'll never get there Right, but there's all kinds of ways to calibrate it, of, um, of calibration jigs that they put into the system, and then they sort of try to sort of realign the cameras and lights and whatnot that's exactly the same. But it's it's never really possible to do it exactly the same, right? So in that sense, even if you redeploy the same model, mm -hmm. you will always have a variation right, yeah. between the different production lines. Now, whether that variation comes from the actual physical difference in the production line, or if you now go back and say, well, let's train one model for each arguably is probably at the same, on the same order of magnitude right so in that sense it's kind of hard to sort of say well you know which one is better in the end like all like you know scary scarily like with all deep learning oftentimes they just have to go and try and run it for a day or two collect data and, and validate that it's actually doing the right thing so, so yeah I, I think you know honestly i can, I can skip over this a bit this is why it's interesting again well, if rule-based, you know, we need a machine vision expert, we have a huge effort to sort of 
uh, program such a because really somebody has to sit down and program it with deep learning you sort of reduce that effort because now the actual programming part is replaced by by learning and with edge learning what we're really targeting is sort of a machine operator that we can really continuously uh, you know reduce that effort and then eventually uh, you know as i said however there's no free lunch if you look at the application difficulty uh, it's clear that if you look at the, the most complicated aesthetic inspection system out there that looks for small tiny defects on very complex surfaces you will always need uh, or let's say never say always i guess but at least now you still need an end-to-end -end system because there <coughs> largely what changes is not even so much how long it takes to train but it's the amount of data that you need you know to show it all the different variables and then when you sort of let go of that application difficulty however i think you can really get more ease of use and in that sense we're really trying to position this on the easy or medium difficult problems and that way just really to go broader right instead of solving the most complex problems try to solve less complicated problems but however solve them in a much easier way than if you would solve them with a rule-based approach or, or or some other means and so essentially like easy it's like presence or absence of a part being there or orientation or exactly or yeah so so yeah um i think i can skip over this here but so one example is for instance you know uh you have this um door panel here for instance and uh, what the customer looks for is for instance those those clips right they have to be present such that you can sort of attach the door <coughs> panel to the actual door and you know there's like examples of uh, those clips being present on the top row versus the ones not being present and arguably that is not a terribly complex task but if you know somebody has to sit down with you know programming and sort of find what are the rules that i could set up in order to, to solve that that uh, would be a significant task to do on the other hand to sort of throw deep learning at that full-fledged deep learning of gps and everything <coughs> that's uh that's not sensible easy right really right so that's that's where the customer says well you know for that now i have to go buy a big computer and, it's new and i have to deal with all that complexity so is there is there a is there a rigorous way to think about what tasks are appropriate for this versus what tasks you say you know what you know i need to go to back to the drawing board i mean to the drawing to, to do more elaborated I, I would love to have such a rigorous <laughs> criteria, honestly. Um, I don't think we have it yet. In, in my can you predict in it? Can, can you have an intuition in advance? Or yes. At least just the yeah. intuition. I think if, if somebody who knows the system looks at it, he he or she can have an intuition. But to transfer that intuition to someone uninformed on paper or something else, I think that's difficult. I think it often happens uh, through examples, like what I'm showing you here, right? And then people say, oh, that looks kind of similar. So you like your reference, something that you've seen in the past. But, um, I but, but if I didn't speak with the experts, let's say that I just look on um, the current network, you now know, giving me a new set of instances. Uh, and I'm asking you, can you guess whether uh, these small, quick, dirty modification would work? Do you have it as, as a data scientist an intuition? I'm not sure. What do you mean? What, what changes? So I mean, my, my, my point is, let's say that I don't understand anything about the context. Like I'm not the expert. Have, I'm just like you have one train where network okay. is doing work, and now I'm giving you, hey, here are five new instances of something new, and I'm asking you, hey, do you think that this small tweak will be sufficient or not? Do you have any sense? any mathematical sense to be able to assess that my or we just need to try and then see if it works all we hope that people who've used our products after a while kind of can guess like reasonably well no mathematical no. Uh, andrew angroy says if a human can do it in like two seconds or less we have a chance of automating it for you it's like a half second or something exactly a threshold of I just think right if you have to squint your eye then it has to do with some perturbation theory or something like that right like and, and that sort of yeah. right thing. another rule of thumb here obviously is like this is a simple classification task right if it's if the thing that you look at it has to sort of fill a significant amount of your you know it has to be sort of well fixed or focused yeah you can just look at the whole thing and say like you know are all the six clips there or not, right? I think it's these kind of rules that we also then tell our customers when they sort of look at such a system, like, hey, that's typically 
what you should do. But in, let's say in all my experience through the, through the years uh, with, with deep learning, it's, it's always been very example-based. So, so, so do you have learning. examples where people tried and it failed completely and it didn't work okay. versus example that it worked? Exactly. Sort of, yeah. 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 Or actually, it's actually, you know, if you ask me that way, it's more like positive examples. <laughs> For example, that, these are examples, typical examples where this has really worked very well. Oh, okay. And then people sort of, based on that, go out and then... So it actually might be interesting also to look on the example where it didn't work at all, because that might actually... Uh, that may be, yeah. I mean, they obviously exist. Um, I think it's... Maybe a self-selection of, uh, yeah. of people. Right. So here's another example, uh, you know, um, a solder pad, electronic part here, and let's say we look at that lower solder pad here, and then the task is just, you know, like in the top row, is it fully filling the actual pad, or is it basically either not complete or missing, right? It's these kind of applications, again, it's not terribly complicated, but if you can solve that with such a camera, with just showing five examples of each, then that's uh, basically what, uh, what people are really you know, interested in because that way you don't have to have all the complexity. And so now I'm handing over to Hans, and he'll take us uh, into another, let's say, a newer tool that we've built with that same idea in mind, which is OCR and um, yeah. So yeah, I'm hoping to talk. So OCR is um, optical character recognition. EL means edge learning here. So we're trying to do optical character recognition training on such a camera as well as running on the camera. And I hope that I'm going to talk a little, go into a little bit more technical detail. I hope to give you a little flavor of the kind of R and D that we do in order to be able to, in order to be able to do that. So first question that people, when they say that, is like, okay, isn't, isn't OCR basically a solved problem these days? <clears throat> and, and, and I just went on Google and typed in like deep learning OCR and that's like a <laughs> bunch of logos. Right? And there's a lot of, lot of companies doing this. And, uh, and some of them work quite well. I think the um, difficulty is that a lot of the commercially available offerings for OCR tend to be focused more on document reading. It's not so much industrial as you know, like you have a receipt, scan the receipt, you have an invoice, scan the invoice. Uh, a lot of these companies are more in that space. And I think like, so um, basically like in some sense, industrial OCR, the things that we typically see are those in the right column there. I think that is harder in a sense in that if you have text on paper, typically it's black on white text, the contrast is relatively good, the image formation you can control in a relatively good way. Whereas on industrial parts, we get a lot of these like really, really poorly formed images here. And often, often it's, um, it's you're, you're writing the, using various different technologies, writing the text directly on metal. Uh, that is problematic, I think. And these are all examples of that, where, where you know, the text just isn't printed very well. And that's very challenging. And so that's one sense in which, you know, I think those commercial offerings don't quite do it for, for the people in the industrial space, and we want to develop something um, for the industrial OCR. In a, very, in a different sense, I think industrial OCR is very easy. And the reason is that I think maybe going more to the academic people who do OCR, they're doing like often trying to solve problems with a lot of like internal variability within each problem. So here is one example is from some paper where they were trying to, you know, read these uh, signs, like just in the street, street view signs, basically. And obviously like the font is very different, the color of the text is very different, sign sign. And so um, what they have to do is that they have to do a big network and lots of training in order to do that. Now, um, in the industrial space, often what you see is like, okay, sure, the text, there's a lot of variability between different production lines, but within each little production lines, you, you have a pretty well-defined task of, yes, the text is printed kind of poorly, but it's always printed poorly in somewhat similar way. And the idea here, and this comes back to, you know, why do we want to do this edge learning thing? The idea is that we don't want to go and train one big network that can read all industrial text because A, that will require lots of training, B, probably won't work, and C, then you can't really run that network in a small device like this. So that goes back to this whole idea of like, okay, what if we let the customer train their own little network for each little production line you can train with hopefully much fewer images and a much smaller network so that you can run it. And we think that's possible because again, you know, 
reading images like this is a much, much simpler task if you can train it specifically for that than reading all of this. Um, by the way, feel free to interrupt with questions. Yeah, can I ask a question? So um, <clears throat> this is similar to Maretza's question earlier. So if you have a small network, it's probably easier to try to characterize to, to try to basically do feature importance within that network and try to characterize which part of the network is responsible for different aspects of the prediction. And so if you were then to have concept drift, well, I, I wonder if, if you've thought about a way to sort of quantify the, the, the distance between the new samples and the old training samples and relate that to uh, like, which nodes of the network might need to change and like how much you would need to train. I think that that is kind of part of this, this other project that we're doing uh -huh. for, for you know, this monitoring uh, stuff like that. And I think uh, certainly, I think you're right that looking at the individual nodes would be helpful there too in, in these small nodes. I mean, to be, obviously that, that's a very exaggerated. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, right? it's what's, not, not four nodes. what's the order of magnitude that we're talking about? Um, you can run like, I don't know, like 50 milliseconds on a Raspberry Pi 3 okay. is, is the order of magnitude. Okay. <laughs> and, and so, okay, so, so then we were, so, so that's kind of where we're coming from, I guess, you know, we, we want to be able to, um, for the customers to train their own network per production line or per, per little task, per, per series of production lines, maybe but per little task that they want to do. How do you do that without requiring a GPU, without requiring a lot of images? And so, um, uh, so, um, so, so that's the question. So, so the basic idea, right? A little bit away, but the, the, the basic idea for how to do that is, okay, we're gonna train the last layer of the network only. That's how we do most of these things. Um, it's not all there is to it, but, but that's sort of the first idea. Uh, and if you do that, you have a chance of maybe being more there. And if you only do that, the, the sort of um, the risk of overfitting is a lot smaller because the sort of capacity, uh, whatever you want to call it, of the network is a lot smaller. So maybe you can get away with it. And so we looked at that. Okay, say great. Let's do. So we have this idea. It works great. Let's do a CR with that. And if you look at how a lot of the academic literature for these kind of OCR networks work, this is just one example. Like. Don't be too much into exactly which example I picked. But the, the sequence typically goes that there's two stages. First, you take the image, and then you detect kind of regions that are text, like typically either a whole row of text or like individual words. And then you send it to a different network that then says, okay, like just crop out that little word, send it to a different network. Well, what is that word? Please read it for me. And then you get the the text outside of it. And the way they do this is that um, typically the first part is some sort of convolutional neural network. Um, just again, different papers don't read too much into the one I picked, but, but you do some sort of scene. And that's not so problematic. We think we can do something with just, just train the last layer of that network. And the problem is that when they do that, often what they do is that when they try to read words, it's some sort of more recurrent uh, neural network. These days it's actually transformers to, um, I think in this example, some sort of convolutional recurrent, there's some LSTM modules and stuff like that. There's some sort of recurrent networks. Uh, and if you're not familiar with how they work, basically like they, you pass in some data, typically it's scanning from one direction or another, pass in some data, you pass it through the network, you get some data that you're gonna have to pass back through the network and then go do that until you've gone through the whole image. And that's, doesn't really work with this whole idea of like just train the last layer because the last layer is not just the last layer because it's kind of recurrent the last layer reoccurs multiple times during the network and so just training the last layer doesn't really work on that so okay so we said okay are we gonna you know when we're doing this research are we just gonna give up uh, we can't do this for OCR and, and so we went back and thought about it and said no that's not quite how it works and, and the secret way that we're doing this it's not that simple, it's pretty obvious, is that we are saying, okay, the other people, they're detecting words. Let's not do that. Let's split it up a bit. So it's still two stages, but we're going to do in, detect individual characters, one each. 
and then we're going to classify each character. And now it's not, there's no recurrence in it. It's just a classification problem with you know, 26 or 36 or however many classes, depending on what an alphabet is. And that we know we can, we can train with, okay, let's just train the last layer. And so, so that's basically the overall um, scheme of how we're doing it. And so it's a pretty obvious idea, right? We're not the first people to, to think about this. Um, the reason I think other people don't really do this are a little bit interesting to think about, because I think this also gives a flavor of how if you're doing industrial OCR, like by just focusing on your actual problem instead of you know reading the latest state of the art OCR papers, you can actually do better. Um, is that I think part of the reason, so there's three reasons they're all listed there, why I think people uh, who are doing more academic research, OCR or less industrial focus, don't do that, is three. One is that in order to train individual, uh, to, to detect individual characters, you have to train the network with annotations of where in each individual character is. Um, and that's, if you're, well, in this space often too, document scanning. If you're, if you're trying to do that for a whole bunch of texts like, like the one on the left, left obviously that's, that's a lot of work to do that annotation, like, like each character, draw a little box around each character, that takes a huge amount of time, nobody wants to do that. But then in the industrial space, we don't have huge streams of text. The problems we see are there's a serial number here. I think it's actually a VIN number or something like that. You want to read that. It's like you know 20 characters at most. Like clicking each individual character, drawing a little box around it isn't that bad uh, to do that. So we don't quite have the same constraints as, as people doing um, the CR for document training. Um, the other thing is that if you have documents, you often have these uh, ligatures that characters sort of together to each other. And even if they're not glued together, they're often like very close together in a way that makes it actually pretty challenging for a neural network to, to detect individual characters. So you can see here, I, know, I think there's some FL ligature here, but even if there's no FL ligatures, there's like, you know, especially the like L's and the I's and stuff like they get very close to the other characters. It's hard to do that. And again, looking at the things that we're trying to do, often you get these like sort of blocky, like it's difficult because the characters are vulnerable, but it's easy because like they're like block capitals and they're often reasonably separated from each other because the kind of things that they want to read is somebody stamps some serial number or something like that. And so again, we have a different problem Why are we trying to do it the way they're doing it. And, and again, the final thing is, um, if you think about it, if you're doing document scanning, uh, the nice thing about reading whole words at the time is that either you can use an explicit dictionary and say, okay, if I think this says, you know, S P L E N K O U R, then I'll just find the closest dictionary word that actually matches that and correct it that way. Uh, but in order to do that, you kind of have to like do the whole word as a unit and. And these days, like people aren't necessarily using explicit dictionaries, but it's they have some sort of like deep learning language model that sort of implicitly still kind of learns which letters often go together in whatever language they're doing, or, or maybe implicitly memorizes the whole dictionary. But there's some sense in which that using this idea of each word is there's actually a lot of redundancy, and if you specify each character, uh, really helps with document scanning. Again, things we're doing. There's some pattern to how VIN numbers work, but it's not like you can just have a dictionary and say, okay, the first row should be one of these things. It's not like how it works. So, so that advantage goes away. And again, that's sort of uh, another way of, you know, okay, let's look up the actual problem that we have, not the problem that these people who wrote this paper has. Really helps us. So um, I think the last thing I want to do is show you a little bit of a demo of how this thing works and I'm training just a few images. Mm -hmm. So I'll, take, I'll take questions while I try to figure out my screen share correctly. Uh, one question from actually from the first slide. Yeah. Um, when you guys were talking about the like the rule-based sort of models that you used to implement back in the 80s, and then the transition towards the deep learning, it definitely seems like that debate that's going on lately, with like Yan Lequin and like this gods of AI about the oh what is like true intelligence if it's like a deep learning sort of things where like everything is learned or like towards a more symbolic sort of like AI, more rule-based, more like sort of like what do you guys did in the 80s? 
uh, do you guys see a future where for your applications, those two sort of paradigms uh, kind of converge and you guys build like this amazing system that can do like, symbolic manipulation, but also like learn simultaneously? Well, yeah, I, I think I would like to correct what you just said. It's not that it's replaced, deep learning is replaced, first right. of all, right? Sure. It's more like it's, it's very complementary and actually <coughs> things happen in parallel. As a matter of fact, I think still deep learning is a fairly small amount of applications. When you say in parallel, like traditional visual inspection products? When, what, what well, product? the, the, the traditional vision tasks that uh, are like more uh, rule-based. Is, is still rule-based. So rule-based is still the, the it's, more prevalent. It's, well, let's say in terms of revenue, is still the, the, the prevalent. In terms of growth, of course, it's, uh, it's deep learning. But it's still, it's a, it's a fairly small amount still, right, with respect to, to, to everything else that the company is doing. That being said, um, yes, we, we actually look also into, we call this smart tools, where we can actually combine the, the best of both worlds, right? It's not really probably what you're thinking towards my like, like symbolic learning, but it's basically saying, hey, I have that uh, extreme precision and speed of, let's say, a rule-based tool to find an edge, right? But now I have lots of edges in this image, and I don't really know which one or let's say it's kind of hard to, to, to extract the right one in, in order to do the measurement that you want to. Then sort of to mix that up with, uh, with learning, with uh, deep learning, in order to sort of just select which edge it is, right? It's not about localizing the edge, so the edge comes from the, 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 the classic tool, let's say, but it helps you choose which one you want to actually then use to do the next step, which is measuring from that edge to that edge, right? And that's something that, uh, that I think is, is, is very interesting. I think what you're hinted towards is, is going even one step further, right? Yes. And, and, and we're not there yet. Of course, <laughs> so, you guys do see it. No, but that is great. It's pretty good what you guys can do. I have a related question. So you, you just mentioned the, the example of edge detection mm -hmm. using rules and deep learning to figure out which edge. Do you, do you have any qualitative insights about what particular tasks rule-based learners and uh, deep learners have relative advantages in precision. So for, for that one, as an example, we don't know how to make a deep learning system that does uh, sub-pixel precise edge location measurements. Yeah. Um, we can tr maybe train one to do that, but it's not really what it's good at. So we have rule-based tools that do you know, compute the correct interpolation and do the sub-pixel precise edge measurements. Yeah. So really like very rigid things that need high precision uh, often are more suited for rule based yeah. things. But the other thing is still speed, right? Yes, we're running a pretty small neural network. Yeah. But compared to the rule based things, that they are pretty slow and a lot of compute power. If you want to run it in like 10, 20 milliseconds, you're so back to using rule based things. Makes sense. Yeah, I think also the other thing is that uh, the big advantage, of course, of rule based is when you have a lot of prior knowledge about your problem right that's through rule based you can really inject that prior knowledge mm -hmm. oftentimes in, in pure learning based it's sort of hard to to bring that knowledge in right mm -hmm. which is it's just valuable i think um what we've tried in the past is to basically say well instead of going full you know end to end which is basically hey here's an image and here's the output is to see can we break it down into smaller logical steps mm -hmm. such that the actual learning problem that you solve in each step is sort of smaller mm -hmm. yeah, then you merged all of them together at the, at the then, output levels right or you just let them run them in sequence right step by step as opposed to say <coughs> let's let's have the system figure it all out by itself and it's mostly related to sort of um focusing in right basically say okay first of all localize where the part is and then correct its position so you, you remove more and more variability from the image such that what the next stage is looking at, it's, it's getting ever simpler, let's mm -hmm. say. And that way it helps both to sort of, you know, for the user to understand if something goes wrong or what went wrong, it's explainability in that sense, but also you can really sort of have your knowledge about the problem that you can bring into this. All right, and so when you say your knowledge about the problem in this case, you're, you're basically talking about being able to precisely characterize the type of variability you have in the images, right? The, if, if you know in which dimensions you're going to have variability, then you can probably. Right, you try to remove that, yeah. right? Yeah.
and that of course you know yeah. coming back to 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 your question before if you would have a system that would automatically you know analyze the data and understand these kind of dimensions and understand that these are irrelevant for the actual task to sort of you know be able to extract that by itself instead of having a human which again needs to sort of understand the problem sort of you know manually input that so, yeah. it's fascinating yeah. I don't know if we have time to do this. Usually we wrap up on that, but I think we have a couple more minutes. So yeah, we'll just, it's, it's kind of what we said. So it's a tool. Um, it hasn't seen this image set before the network. I'm just going to try to train it uh, on the fly. Uh, it's unfortunately not running on that. It's running on some server, but you know, it, just, it, it can run on that in principle. Okay. So, um, so here, here's the network that does out of the box, and you can see it's reading it, but it's not doing very well. Like it thinks this is a Q, it thinks this is a G, B, Z, it just thinks this is an H, it's not super good. Um, and, and because it hasn't seen this image before, and the image is kind of difficult. So what I can do with our tool then is I can just label this quickly. Let's go see how can see or H, H, position. And you can see that we're detecting characters H N S X. Just gonna label this one. So it's six zero three zero two three eight. And so I'm just gonna label one image. And now already the network is gonna do quite a bit better just learning from that one image. And uh, so you can actually see it's still not perfect. And um, since B zero V Z. I think this was an L. I believe that I've never trained a C with it, so that's why I do that. But the idea is that really, with you know, pretty little labeling effort, and you get feedback as you're doing it, and the network can actually learn to do this task pretty well. So now I've labeled two images. Let's see how it does. Okay, zero V Z. But when when Hans says labels, he also labels and trains basically. Right? Labels and it's training on the background. But you can see now there's one character on that labeled and trained on two images. Uh, let's fix that. I think everything else was already correct. And and basically, you know, you know, with this kind of task, like with five images, maybe you need need a little more for some more difficult. One. You really get to the point where it's not that much effort. You go to your lines, put your camera there, open the interface, mm -hmm. label it, click run. I mean, wait for a day, see how well it does, right? But still, like, it's, you don't have to go through a lot of effort to do it. So, yeah, that was the demo, and that was the last thing we had. Great. Yeah, Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, for this, it seems like this would be a great spot to use transfer learning if you have. The same machine that does the same kind of printing on a bunch of different parts in the factory. Yeah. How do you think of that? More broadly? right. That's kind of related right? to this this question of like, oh, do we like transfer the models over or not? And I think um, this also ties into a little bit of things we're doing at the company, which I think like right now we're not very good at, and the industry isn't very good at, which is more these kind of IoT kind of things. Yeah. Like it's the problem with transferring models more is that it's a bit of a hassle right now with how the tooling where you copy some files over that if everything was a little more intelligent and yeah. to make that easier, I think that would really help. With, with those yeah, I'm curious how Cognac thinks of that more broadly, because I'm used to instruments that only have a local connection, either analog or discrete to the controller and fleet management. It's very much a manual process. That, that is a, a big project or initiative now, really sort of you know, connect the devices and, and really have you know the, those cameras being sort of connected somewhere such that you can manage them. So look at you know harder performances you can monitor them all of this uh, but that's something that we're sort of now working on really it's, uh, it hasn't been really uh, as, as Hans said a bit i mean it hasn't been a big topic i think it all goes into iot industry 4.0 right well it's just kind of topic switch uh, you know it is happening <laughs> I just, uh, sorry, just one last question do you have any system to kind of measure the like after you take a picture like we can detect this now something there on but is there like a technique to like measure some like the dimensions of poles yes so the that I think it's really the rule based that I mentioned before which is essentially a, a tool set that allows you to in an image to specify hey look look for a circle for instance and then it will give you hey I found a circle here and it has this diameter right 
So that is that is basically the the, the rule-based technology that uh, that the company has developed for the last you know, four decades. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if that's all for questions, we are a little over time, but yeah. really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can we do a shameless plug for this Yes, go so, for it. Uh, yes, thank you for being here. I, I don't know if you, well, like all of you are aware, but uh, we're having a symposium next Monday, graciously sponsored by you guys. We're extremely excited. Uh, but if any one of these rooms is not attending, I would prompt you to register, get your tickets, because it's going to be amazing. The whole event, we have a lot of speakers. We have 20 posters being presented uh we have food we have beer at night uh great people uh and the venue is beautiful as well so yeah and, and thank you guys also for it first time thank you yeah, even a better season than that <laughs>